Welcome everyone to another webinar organized by the African Space Leadership uh, Institute. Um, many countries, including countries in Africa, invest resources in space programs with the aim of utilizing space-based technologies like remote sensing and satellite navigation to benefit the society. Uh, the benefits include employment growth, addressing societal challenges, such as climate change, which has been um, in the news of recent, recent um, the issue of food insecurity. Uh, however, without a legal and policy framework that supports the collection, use, and distribution of data from these technologies, the intended benefits uh, may not be realized. And that's why we are organizing them, this webinar. Um, geospatial policy and law, as some of us may know, it's a new and growing field which deals with the complex legal policy and ethical issues relating with geospatial technologies. Uh, when we use geospatial technologies for collecting, using, or dissemination of satellite, remote sensing, and PNT. Uh, the, there are several issues that are uh, relating to geospatial policy and law, including data sovereignty, national security issues, intellectual property issues, licensing, data sharing, data quality and liability, even things including international treaties, uh, privacy and data protection. Uh, in today's webinar, uh, Mr. Kevin Pomfret, whom I will introduce shortly, will discuss how geospatial law can impact on the success of the country's space programs. And this is very timely, especially as several African countries are beginning to um, start off space programs uh, within their countries. Uh, Mr. Pompey will also draw on guidance from the UN Integrated Geospatial Information Framework and explore how it can be applied to integrating the space and geospatial communities within the country from a legal and policy standpoint. Uh, one of the things you observe is that it appears the geospatial community sometimes appears to be separate from the space community, which should not be. We hope with this webinar, we'll be able to kind of integrate the two communities and see how. Uh, I mean, there should be mutual collaboration and mutual benefit. But before Mr. Pomfrey comes up, uh, we'll have two opening remarks to set the stage for the webinar. Uh, one opening remark from Mr. Uh, Andre Nongiema and another one from uh, Dr. Tidian Rotara. These are well-known persons within the African space community. So I won't go into details about um, reading their bios. Uh, I'll first call Mr. Andre Nongema, who is currently the chief of the Geospatial Information Network at the UN Economic Commission for Africa. He oversees the ECA's work in advancing holistic geospatial information management strategies and governance and providing assistance to African countries and regional entities in the development and implementation of spatial information uh, infrastructure. In particular, Mr. Nongema focuses on leveraging geospatial data, information and analytics to support strategic decision making and evidence based policy analysis across a range of applications from the public sector to the academia and the private sector. Um, Mr. Nongema, you have the floor, please. You can give us your opening remark. Hello, Mr. Nongema. Hi, uh, good morning and good afternoon to all of us. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, very well. Yeah. Okay, but for some reason I cannot uh, activate the, I cannot start the video. It's not activated from my side, but it doesn't matter. I believe uh, uh, we can still proceed uh since you are able to hear what i'm saying um i would like first of all to acknowledge the executive board mem members of the african space leadership institute and also to acknowledge the representative of the african union dr watara uh, representative of uh, international space and geospatial organization across Africa and uh, elsewhere. Uh, dear participants, dear colleagues, 
Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here this uh, this afternoon, uh, speaking from Addis uh, on this uh, webinar uh, related to space and geospatial policy and law. Uh, I may start by saying that uh, over the the past years, the Economic Commission for Africa has uh, made substantive effort to to put in place policies resources and, and, and structures so that to, to ensure that uh, specially enabled information and uh, specially related technology are available and accessible to our community of users in Africa in a coordinate way, uh, both at uh, regional and uh, national level. But as for today, um, I must acknowledge that we don't have yet a, a full overarching formal and shared legal framework for space and geospatial information management in the continent. And in fact, some of the statistics I'm seeing are even scary, not to say depressing, uh, because I, I was just reading the last couple of days that uh, for Western Africa, for instance, we can only count two countries that have at least a component of a legal framework in their geospatial uh, information management process. Uh, and the same apply for the other subregion of uh, Africa. Uh, we, nevertheless, we, my acknowledge that uh, progress uh, have been made uh, to put in place uh, regula regulatory frameworks across the continent. And as we see today, we still have a long way to go. We have done many things, but still uh, not good enough. And I remember that I, that we started at uh, ECA advocating for uh, establishment of uh, regulatory framework uh, for geospatial information utilization in Africa back to um, the early stage of uh, year 2000, when we first published in 2003, um, the special data infrastructure uh, in Africa implementation guide and since then, uh, progress has been slow, but uh, I believe that you can get me right that uh, uh, law and uh, regulatory frameworks uh, are only tools. They are not uh, the hand result. And in this sense, I can agree more that uh, with uh, some of the Chinese wisdom is saying that uh, we do not, don't need to fear going forward slowly. We only fear to stand still. And my sense is that uh, uh, the effort that has been made so far um, is a, a continuous process and that require some some patience and uh, some some persistence. We need to um, preserve uh, the positive, to be flexible, and above all, continue to create trust and ownership at the at the African level. Uh, yes, I, I was saying that we have a long way to go, but we have already uh gone so far from where we used to be at the beginning and i believe we must acknowledge that uh while we are still working to be proud of what we have done so far and specifically uh since uh, 2012 we have started engaging with uh, kevin uh on how we can build uh, a regulatory framework for geospatial information utilization in Africa. And I can still remember, and this is still uh, in our hands, that uh, from the discussion we had, it was clear that uh, we can best adopt a phased approach 
uh, with a certain number of uh, step uh, to follow when we are developing a comprehensive legal framework for geospatial and space information uh, in Africa. And uh, I remember that uh, um, from the support we received from uh, Kevin, uh, we have said that at phase one, we need to develop a, a baseline assessment of what is existing as legal and regulatory framework. And with that, identify some of the challenges uh, that are unique to our region and to our uh, countries. And at a second stage, uh, we should identify some of the gaps between what is existing and uh, what is uh, existing in, 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 in our context, in our circumstances, and the best practice, practice around the, the, the world. And the third phase uh, will be the substantive work to prepare uh, some of the laws, policy, regulation, agreement uh, that will address uh, some of the identified ga gaps. And at the end of the day, uh, at the latter stage, um, we could assess uh, and 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 appraise some some of the improvement uh, and conduct. Uh, some audit to identify new unforeseen or new legal and regulatory issues, uh, challenges as they arise so that we can use them and ensure that uh, our framework evolve with uh, uh, technology change and also with our uh, circumstances. And uh, I made this uh, uh, reminder to um, uh, tell ourselves that uh, we have the expectation that time has now come to to start implementing all these steps uh, within a reasonable time frame. And I hope that uh, today webinar will give us some some hints on how we can pick uh, the low hanging fruit. Uh, so. I have the expectation that uh, we are here to hear from the audience, from the good people around uh, this webinar, where we should give uh, more emphasis and of course, act accordingly. As for now, let me conclude with uh, three avenues I would like us to to, to further explore during, during this webinar. The first one is uh, uh, how do we uh, design the approach to be used when we are developing a holistic legal uh, framework, not only for geospatial, but for, for space. And like uh, what uh, Etima just said, that we need to ensure that both community are fully synchronized and, and integrated. Uh, for me, uh, the legal and regulatory framework for uh, spatial information utilization should reflect and implement uh, what is existing uh, at global, international level, downscale to regional, continental, and, and national level. And uh, the United Nations uh, has established the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework with uh, some robust legal and policy pathways uh, that can help us integrate the space and, and geospatial policy. Uh, and uh, for me, it's essential to institute uh, the appropriate uh, mechanism that can don't scale what is existing at this global level to national legislation and policy. Uh, second, I, we all accept that uh, geospatial could be a double-edged sword uh, regarding its port in providing access to a vast amount of data and the opportunity to abuse even to misinform or to invite the, priva the privacy of individual 
on a, a greater scale than ever before. So um, it will be interesting to hear how we ensure that uh, we safeguard, safeguard personal data when we conduct any operation or set of operation, uh, like gathering, exploitation, registration, organization, conservation, modification, extraction, copying, consulting, utili utili utilization of uh, uh, data that might have a bearing on, on individuals or uh, personal uh, data. So uh, this is maybe sometimes an area where uh, people are very re reluctant to uh, in work uh, or in hiding the potential of uh, special data in the African continent. A third aspect is how do we also identify or map out some of the stakeholders in the area of uh, government agency, private industry, citizen, and of course, a number of uh, academic, scientific organization and non-government organizations uh, all these major uh, actors or stakeholders in in producing and 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 using uh, space and geospatial information. And the last point, also maybe uh, I would like us to um, further discuss through this webinar is how do we uh, start in the. Uh, in the mind of uh, uh, influential people like policy makers or decision makers, because policy development is a, a sensitive issue. Uh, as we always say, it involves people influence, their privilege, uh, their uh, uh, struggle for power in the respective area of uh, concern. So how do we ensure that we engage with them, we uh, make sure that they understand buying what we want to put in place uh, because at the ultimate uh, stage, they are the one making, making the decision. I will stop here in looking forward to hearing more above what we have accomplished so far and, and, and how we can continue to, to accomplish or to deliver uh, together. From my own perspective as I'm sitting now, uh, I, I can say that we are grateful for Kevin continued engagement with the space and geospatial community in Africa uh, so that we build uh, this collective vision, purpose and action uh, to our a, an African legal and regulatory framework for uh, space and geospatial information utilization in, in our continent. A team and colleagues, I thank you for the opportunity to give this uh, few remarks and thank you very much for listening. And we look forward to a very interesting and uh, engaging conversation. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, Mr. Nongema. Um, Thanks for giving the, a background to the things, the activities that have been going on, uh, many of which um, uh, some of us are not actually aware. And uh, for, I mean, I, I, I mean, from our past discussion, I think you had even mentioned to me the contributions of um, Kelvin uh, in this effort. So we are really happy to have him uh, here again to facilitate the webinar. Thanks also for the points that you've uh, kind of Issue, some issues that you've already set uh, on ground, which I believe Kelvin already has in mind to uh, respond to. Um, I, I don't see Tidian here. Um, maybe he's going to join us later. So I think we can just go straight into the um, webinar. Um, before Kelvin starts, uh, if you do, let me just give uh, kind of read a short bio about Kelvin. Um, Mr. Kevin Pomfret advises technology companies and government contractors on mergers and acquisitions, raising funds from private equity and venture capitalists, joint ventures, and other corporate transactions. He also counsels companies on technology joint ventures, software and data licenses, and privacy and data protection laws. 
As a former satellite imagery analyst, Kelvin's practice includes representing a number of companies in the space and geospatial industries. He has presented at congressional hearings and the UN committee meetings, and is a member of the US Department of Commerce Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing. And uh, I don't know that Kelvin, you can see Rose Crochet here. She's with the uh, Department of Commerce now. And um, he's also an adjunct professor on geospatial law and ethics at John Hopkins University and regularly conducts training and workshops across the globe on legal and policy issues associated with the collection, use, storage, and distribution of geospatial information. Uh, Kevin was recently recognized by Who is Who Legal as an outstanding lawyer in the transport, that's um, international space and satellite market, one of the only 47 attorneys selected for this honor and is listed in the best lawyers in America. Mr. Pomfret is a graduate of Washington and Lee School of Law and Bates College. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kevin. Uh, you have the floor now. Thank you, uh, team, and uh, and Andre. Um, thank you for the remarks. Um, it was a great, great way to begin. I'm going to share my screen. I have some slides here, so let me um, it'll just take me a second to to do that. Can you can you see my slides? Yes. Yeah. Okay. You, you can you can see the slides. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, again, thank you, that team, for for inviting me and Andre. Um, it's good to connect with you and some other friends on the on the on the program today and seeing you participating. So I really appreciate this opportunity. Um, just for those of you who don't know me, um, I began my career, as a team said, as a satellite imagery analyst. I've, I've had the real good fortune over my career of working both in the space and geospatial sectors. And that's allowed me to meet some really incredible people who are doing some, some fantastic things. Um, and so I've been able to work with UNGGIM, uh, GEO, World Bank, on a number of projects, a lot of them having to do with, you know, as you would expect, the legal and policy frameworks. Um, and you know that's my background as a lawyer. After I went as a satellite imagery analyst, I went to law school, became a, a business and, and corporate lawyer here in the United States, but retained an interest in geospatial technologies, remote sensing, as the, and as they became more um, ubiquitous and were being used in, in more and more ways, I was I was in, you know realized that there were a number of policy and legal issues that were were needed to be considered. Um, I started the Center for Spatial Law and Policy. Um, I became an adjunct professor, and it was my honor and privilege to be recognized uh, last year at the geospatial um, by space, geospatial world as the 2022 geospatial, geospatial ambassador of the year. So it's um, it's really exciting for me to be able to sort of talk about the intersection of of space and geospatial from a legal and policy standpoint. So. So first of all, I think, you know, space has become such a, a hot area for lots of really important reasons. And so, for instance, I believe tomorrow Elon Musk's uh, SpaceX company is going to get ready to um, try to launch for the first time at Starship uh, launch vehicle, which by all accounts will be a game changer for the space industry in terms of its reusability and the amount of um, weight that it can carry and take into space and can take us to the moon and we can do things in space in terms of manufacturing and exploration and human exploration. It's really an exciting time. Um, but I think for the near term anyways, space will continue to be more important or one of the mo one of the most important, if not the most important issues will be around the things that it can do for Earth, right? So we're looking at Earth observation, PNT, communications, those are the things right now that we're experiencing. And those are just as exciting, at least for me, and I think on for many of the folks on this call in terms of uh, the opportunities that it, that it provides, particularly to deal with so many of the large critical issues that we as a, as a world are dealing with now, both at the national, um, local, uh, and then the international. And, and so on the slide here, you'll see some of the ones 
agriculture, humanitarian assistance, climate change, weather, um, even health care, food security. And then we've got all these frameworks that we've been working with with the UN and other groups around these issues that requires monitoring and data. And a lot of them, in order to, to collect it, you're going to need space and space assets to do that. So it's an exciting time for space in general, but I think it's even more exciting time for those of us who are in the intersection of space and, and geospatial. And I think this is, um, and, and I'm not, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm an observer based in the United States, so I, I don't have um, the expertise and knowledge of, of many of the folks on this call about developments in Africa in the space community. But as an observer from the outside, it does seem like there are a lot of developments, a lot of countries that are looking at developing a space sector um, in several different factors, several different roles. But the in my mind, for many countries of the world in the near term, again, human space flight, space exploration are, are critical and they're going to be exciting and there's going to be a lot of money to be made and, and a lot of you know scientific discoveries and all of that. But for many parts of the world, it will primarily be Earth observation, PNT and communication <clears throat> that deal with that are going to provide the benefits at the national level for countries that are developing these space programs. And in my my view, and, and I've had conversations with that team about this and Andre as well, if there isn't a clear link between the geospatial and the space sectors in terms of how to use the data that's being collected, that's being transmitted at the national level, there's a risk that the space sector within these countries will, will not achieve the success that, you know, frankly, everyone wants and everyone's been promoting. Um, so... So I think the other aspect of this, and Andre touched about this a little bit as well, you know, space is important and the data that's collected is very, very valuable, but it doesn't have solve all the answers. It, it, does, it doesn't solve all the problems. It doesn't have all the answers. You need to be able to aggregate data from a variety of senses, from a variety of sources. So you, you need to get ground-based um, drones, um, crewed aircraft, uh, statistical data, the, the full body, the full suite of information that is available and is, is currently being collected, and hopefully more of it will be collected and used, you need to aggregate these data. And, and here's a couple of examples from the Geo Blue, Geo Blue, Blue Planet Initiative, the Land Degradation Neutrality Initiative, in terms of the type of data that's being combined with Earth, satellite Earth observation data, with other types of data to help solve these issues. So Space sector is important, geospatial is important, but we need to we need to bring them together. And in my experience, and and you know, perhaps in, in some in some countries this is no longer the case, but in in my experience, still the space sector is still very separate from the geospatial sector or the 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 community, the ecosystem in geospatial and space. And, and this is intended to represent that they're two different silos. Um, so they're, they're, they've got their own budgets, they go to their own conferences, they've got their own training facilities, they've got their own procurement process, they've got their own um, management uh, initiatives and meetings, both very important, but not the sort of working together that you would hope that will be able to do the type of things that we've talked about in the earlier slides, the, the ability to collect and share data um, in a way that adds value to both sectors. Right. And that's and that's not that's a, that in my experience, that's worldwide. The U.S. has the same problem. I believe Europe, many countries in Europe have the same problem is that we've got these communities. They're both doing exciting things. They're both very passionate about what they're doing. But there's not much linkage, particularly as I'll talk about on the policy and legal side in terms of how they're going to work together. So in my view, um, I see them as, as a significant overlap, particularly around Earth observation and, and PNT, right? So you've got the space sector, you've got the geospatial sector, and they've got their own unique issues. Um, but you've got you've also got a great deal of overlap and, and remote sensing, Earth observation, PNT, and even you know, downlink and communication, you could put that in there as well. They're all sort of part of this and needs to work together. And governments, their policy and legal frameworks needs to help support that so that these are goals that can be can be achieved. 
So I, I believe it was that team had had suggested that the you know what's the definition of the geospatial policy and legal and framework. And in my mind, it, re it refers to all the laws and policies that impact the acquisition, aggregation, and distribution of all types of geospatial information. Any type of information that has a uh, has a, 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 a component, a lat long, or some address, or something that ties it to the Earth. Um, and this, this impacts the entire geospatial ecosystem. And that's one of the unique aspects, I believe, of the geospatial community is it touches on so many different communities. It's such a versatile type of information. You know, healthcare information is very important. Financial information is obviously very important. But they are they have more narrow um, you know, uses and 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 are uh, developed around particular applications where geospatial can be used so broadly. So the same data set can be used by the government. It can be used by uh, individual. It can be used by the NGO. It can be used by industry, and that raises some real issues around a legal and policy framework, right? So that those are one of the aspects of it. Um, and then it cuts across technology platforms and sectors and legal domains. It's a it's a very broad area, um, but it's a very critical one. I, I like to say, um, some of you probably heard me say this maybe more times than you care to hear, that the geospatial community, and, and by this I also mean the Earth observation community, was big data before big data was cool, right? And so it has been dealing with these issues and and for longer than many other communities. And now these communities are starting to pay attention. Regulators are taking are paying attention. Andre mentioned the issues around data protection and privacy. Without a broad understanding of how you bent the weighing the benefits of risks of regulation around privacy with the benefits of geospatial information, not just for individuals, not just for industries, but for government, for transnational issues, without a discussion, a fulsome discussion around that, you have a real, you have a real possibility of having negative um, legal and policy frameworks that are too restrictive and aren't able to do some of the things that these communities, both the space and the geospatial sector, can can combine and and create. And that's that's one of the things that, you know, in my work that I've been trying to sort of, uh, you know, raise awareness of, if you will. So as I, I've talked about a little bit, um, geospatial information, in my view, is very unique. Um, it's different types. So we've got, as we talked about, Earth observation, we've got insight to, we've got statistical into the information. We've got the data themes associated with, uh, you know, traditional NSDI programs. It's got broad set of uses, um, and people are both data collectors and data users. So very conceivably that you could use Earth observation data with data that's collected from an individual's phone and then uploaded together to come up with a on the ground situation of what someone is seeing from the earth. I mean, that's a really powerful tool, but it also raises some, as you can imagine, some very unique legal issues. Um, and as I've talked about before, you, you have this sense where if you have a law regulation or policy that impacts geospatial in one information, one sector. So if you're trying to regulate the private industry, because you're concerned about some issues there, it very well could impact the ability for government to get the type of data that, that this needs. And this goes back to the point I made earlier. Very few of the problems that the world is facing right now can be resolved by one data type or one data source. It's going to take a lot of different data types and sources and people working together to kind of work through these solutions. And that, again, I think the geospatial community understands that better than, than most. But there's still a long way to go because there is this sense of, well, if we're concerned about one aspect, that may be the case, but you need to understand what impact it's going to have either directly or indirectly or other aspects of the community. The other thing that I think is really important to consider from a legal standpoint around Earth observation, PNT data, geospatial data is it's meant to be shared, right? The data is meant to be People acquire this data because they want to do something with it. They want to show it to their citizens. They don't want to show it to other agencies. They want to show it to uh, their customers. They want to show it to their suppliers. They want to show it to uh, donors. All, lots of reasons why, you, lots of groups that want to be shared with, but it's meant to be shared. It's not, and so there's this tension between security, national security, privacy, and actually intellectual property rights and licensing regimes. And this uh, desire and, frankly, need to share this information to fulfill its broader value. And that's a real challenge from a legal standpoint. And, I've, and I would suggest that many countries are still dealing with that. We certainly are here in the United States. 
in terms of where do you draw that line and where are you hurting um, the communities more than the, than you're helping them despite the best effort. So that's something else that I think is important to keep in mind. So here are some of the key considerations that I think about when I'm thinking about how the space community might interact with the geospatial community, right? So from a funding span standpoint, how are these budgets being done, not only to launch satellites and build ground stations, and but who's making the decision in terms of how much of this is going to go to processing the data, analyzing the data, securing the data? You know, how does that fit into the overall space program? Who decides what sensors to put on the satellites and what their capabilities will be, right? Because different sensors can be used or can, are better suited for different applications. And what are the priority applications in the, in the, in the country? And who's the, making that decision, both from a technical um, standpoint, but also from a data standpoint and also from a budgeting standpoint? Who is responsible for what data is to collect from a tasking standpoint? Who makes a decision about where you're going to collect that data? And who's going to be responsible for collecting? Because... You know, for many parts of the world, there are limited resources. The satellites can only collect so much. And so you're, there are trade-offs involved. And I won't go through all of these, but I think you can see some of the, the, the decision-making that I think goes into when you're building a space program and you're thinking about well, how I want to use um, Earth observation, PNT data, you use the communication system. How are we going to get people involved? How are we going to include the geospatial sector? Not because... They, they not for any other reason, frankly, then it's helping the space sector. It helps the geospatial community, but it helps the space sector. If you're talking about the value it's going to provide to to people and to the to the nation and the citizens, this is some of the real ways that needs to be done. And in my experience, these are some of the some of the roadblocks or considerations that need to be thought through. So as I talked about, you know, data sharing is a real important issue, right? You can collect this data from space, but who, who, if you're not able to share it both between government agencies, with the with industry, with the NGO community, what, with individuals, you lose the the all the value. You lose the value, most of the value that you get, particularly if they can't aggregate it with other types of data. And and trying to think through what that means is really difficult because it involves bringing together a lot of people. And not just the people that you traditionally interact with, but going out and talking to the users, going listening to what their concerns are. One of the things that I I found, and I've I've, I've talked about this a, little, a couple of times, a lot of people I've, I've gotten some really nice people said really nice things things about the work that I'm doing and the talks that I give and the issues that I raise, but they don't think it applies to them. Although they're dealing with these issues, they think those issues are unique to them unique to their government industry or government sector, unique to their industry. I, I'll tell you that these issues, in my experience, cut across all, all domains, national, international. It's the same set of issues. It's just how they play out in their priority, depending on your size, where you are in the ecosystem, your geomaturity. But these are all the issues that everyone is dealing with. They're called different things um, in different countries and even in different sectors. But the, in my mind, these are the main issues that you that you need to deal with. So, for instance, on national security, a lot of Earth observation, a lot of satellite space sector is from comes from the the defense the defense um, sector, intelligence sector, and just because of their training, just because of the way that they look at the world, which is understandable, they tend to be worried about sharing data for national security purposes. We have that here in the United States. I'm sure that's universal across you know many countries. The procurement process to buy the data. So, for instance, if you got government data for Earth observation, if you and, and that's very powerful, that's very useful, but you need to combine it with other types of data. Um, that may be from um, the private sector, whether it be other types of space derived data or other types of data. How do you buy that? What rights do you have to use it? Who owns it? Uh, Andre mentioned the data protection, privacy. People are getting more concerned about cybersecurity because it cuts across a number of different sectors and you want to combine data from the, ag the farming or agriculture community with data from the space community, with able, beta, day, excuse me, data from mobile devices, you're, you're looking at how do you cut across those different sectors that have different regulators associated with it, because often a, a agriculture regulator will be different than the privacy regulator, which will be different from the communications regulator that'll be different from the space regulator. 
but you need to combine those data sets in a way that, that can add value and you need to work through those regulations. And frankly, data sharing, one of the things that I've noticed in the in the world, and, and part of the, and Andre touched on this as well, you need to develop a policy and legal framework that works within your legal system, your cultural, your culture, your history. Um, and one of the things is in some parts of the world, some legal systems, if you don't have a direct authority that says you, you must share data, then some government agencies are reluctant to share data because they they don't they think they don't have the authority to do it or the risks associated with sharing on some of the other things that I talk about here are so great that they that they're not they don't want to take that risk so there's no mandate for them to share so they don't share now don't get me wrong even if there is a mandate to share many countries of the world still struggle around the world still struggle with that but for some countries even having that mandate is important to even begin the discussion so i just I just sort of raise that as something to, to consider. Andre mentioned um, the work that the UNGGIM um, has been doing on this. Um, and he, he also mentioned, I, I, I did, did some work back in, um, it's been a number of years now before the UNGGIM really got off the ground. But UN, the, one of the things that uh, UNGGIM has done over the past several years is they've, they've tried to look at a holistic, integrated geospatial information framework. So not just the traditional geospatial sector, but the larger geospatial ecosystem, and I would argue that includes the space sector as well, getting the different data types together, figuring out how to, how to work together, understanding that laws and policies are different, that country, countries are in different stages, but it, so developing a framework for these for countries to be able to go in and say, okay, how how can we start doing this within our our national situation? Um, and this this UNGGIM worked with the World Bank to create this IGIF. It's anchored by nine strategic pathways um, that are really there are sort of three big boxes, right? Governance, technology, and people. And then within those, they're broken into three sort of strategic pathways that I'll discuss here in a minute, but the goal is to help governments integrate geospatial information management across whole of government. And I think this can be a really valuable approach in thinking about how to work the geospatial community to work with the with the space community. It's not perfect, it, it requires some work. It's not a, it's not a simply you roll it out and, and here we go, um, you know, it's, it's all done, but it is a process, it is a mechanism, I think, to start thinking about that. Now, as a disclaimer, I, I have worked on um, parts of this, particularly Strategic Pathway 2, which I will discuss in a minute, which is the policy and legal aspect of it. Um, but so I do have, I guess, a vested interest in that. But I also do think it is a it is a way of thinking and a, and a tool that countries can use to start working through some of these issues. And I think it, it particularly in the space geospatial sector, it's a it, you can start using the same language. You can start to um, Andre's point. Do some gaps analysis in terms of where we are. What what do we need to do? How do we get to where we want to go? So here are the nine strategic pathways, and as you can see, they they deal with issues around governance and technology. Um, so data innovation and standards would be more around the the technology side, and then people. Um, so partnerships. How do you work with the, in the private sector? How do you work with universities? Um, how do you work with NGOs, the capacity and education building? How do you develop you know, the next generation that can work together to support this? And how do you get the community engaged? So for instance, in this area, how do you get the community to see the value of the space sector and the geospatial sector working together? And that community could be the policy community, it could be citizens. I mean, there's some real there's some real opportunities there to to help in this in this area and so this is the these are the nine strategic pathways um i'll mention this a couple times but on the, if you go to the UNGGIM website they have many more details on each of these frameworks and how you can how you can work with a country how a country can work with them and adapt to their own situation um i'm only going i'm not going to touch on these other than to to say you know very generally how how important they are and i am going to touch on the strategic pathway to. Um, and so this is this is the one, as I said, that is sort of policy and legal frameworks, um, which is touches on many of the other aspects of it. So that's that's why I think it's particularly important because you need to have those the frameworks in place to help support data, to help support standards, to help to make sure you've got the budget process in place, to make sure you've got the partnerships in place. 
a lot of those aren't going to work without a, an enabling policy and legal and framework that not only is enables geospatial information collection and use and sharing, um, but also protects against the you know the concerns that people have and making that balance. And it needs to be a balance that every country needs to deal with. And they need to understand the risks and rewards of going one way too far or the other way. And that's and I think the folks on this call, uh, many of whom that I've worked with and I know, um, you know, have this expertise to help have that discussion. Um, it's not just a law, uh, right? So you just don't roll out a law. Laws, there are benefits to having a law, but there are also challenges associated with it. They're really hard to, to pass. They take a lot of time. Um, because they're so important, because they're binding on so many people, and because you know they're enforceable, so a lot of you want to get it right, and then when you try to change it, which is really important in in a community like this that's moving quickly, technology is adapting quickly. It's really hard to change. So you've got laws, you've got policies, you can have regulations, you can have agreements, you can have best practices. There's a bunch of tools that you can use in this in this toolbox, if you will, to develop this policy and legal framework. And each one needs to be suitable for your particular particular use. So I, this this strategic pathway too. And again, I would suggest that you go to the um, to UNGGIM and take a look at all the pathways, and and you can download. And there's are all publicly available, and they've been translated into into several languages, I believe each one and they're being updated and revised. So this is a, you know, a, a live, live, breathing living document, but I think there it's a useful starting point for the space and the geospatial communities within countries to begin working together. Uh, one of the things that's been done, and again, I, I helped to work on this with the UNGGIM policy and legal community. So again, I do have a, a full disclosure, a vested interest in doing it, but we did create sort of three templates we did create an annotated data sharing agreement, a form policy and draft legislation. They're very, very high level because they need to, they're, they're for, you know, they're drafted for the international community. And as I've said, the legal systems change are so different. The culture is so different. The geomaturity is so different. So they're trying, they're intended to be sort of a baseline for legal experts, space experts, or geospatial experts to take a look at and to adapt to their national circumstances. But it's an opportunity to sort of jumpstart you to say, okay, these are some of the things to think about. These are some of the documents that you're going to need. Please don't cut and paste them. They're 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 structured so you can't. Although you could probably just, I guess, type them over. But you, the goal is not to just say, okay, we're going to adopt this, but to use it as a starting point. And you can go to the UNGGIM uh, policy and legal uh, website, uh, and you can find. These documents here um, would appreciate any feedback that you have. They're not going to be perfect for your circumstances by any means, but I think they are going to be a useful starting point. So I could see as you're developing a space policy, if you look at some of the language, for instance, from the geospatial policy, making sure some of those issues are, are included. Draft legislation, there's some language in there or some sections that you may want to use. And then data sharing agreement could be a foundation, for instance, to use how do you share space data with other geospatial data? And how do you share how do agencies that collect geospatial data share it with the space agencies or other agencies that are using space data? So those are the that's the thought process behind them. Um, and I, I hope that you can, um, you know, you'll take a look at them and, and see how that you could adapt them to your situation. I've just I took a, a a shot at sort of how you could align. You know, if you remember the, the 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 diagram that I had about where the geospatial and the space sector work together, how I see them working together. So how you might be able to align the sectors using the IGIF as a framework and some of the um, you know procedures that they've identified and some of the thoughts that they've identified. You know, a committee of stakeholders bringing in data providers and users from across the community. Also working with the international community as well and, and finding sort of, you know, what's best practices, how are people working together, what do we need to do better, what are we, what are we doing right, you know, where, where do we go, right, where, what meetings do we go to, what, where, where do we go to get help. Um, I've been, you know, as I've said, I, I go to both geospatial and the space sector meetings. I know I have a number of friends in both. 
But bringing them together and having understanding what they're both working for, what they both are trying to do, what their obstacles are, I think will be increasingly in, important. And that's going to, you know, frankly involve someone from one of the sectors picking up the phone and calling up someone from the other sector and saying, hey, let's let's get together and talk about some of these things. Here's some ideas that I have. Here's some documents that I have. And what do, what do you think? How can we work together? Um, as Andre said, you know, identifying the policy and legal gaps, who's responsible for what, what are the institutional arrangements, um, how do we align our space policy with geospatial information management policy on the areas that they need to align, right? Doesn't need to align on human space flight, doesn't need to align on um, exploration. There are certain aspects of space, obviously, that are very, that are very different from geospatial, but there's this overlap. How do we align those? What's the best mechanism? Do we use laws? Do we use policies? Do we just have an agreement, an MOU or something in place as a starting point? As Andre had mentioned earlier, you can sort of build, um, you know, you crawl, walk, run. We don't need to have a law right away. If we can have something in place where we can get people to agree on a trial basis, that may work for a particular country or a particular sector. Um, I do think agreements are going to be important for data sharing, but you also need to consider security, data protection and privacy laws, open data policies. Where does that fit into what you're doing? What is your government looking at from an from a broader perspective on on some of these issues? So you know, there's there are countries, and I believe many um, countries in Africa have developed data protection laws. Um, how do they impact what we're doing in the geospatial sector? How do they impact what we're doing in the space sector? Because at the end of the day, it's the data, right? It's not the it's not the sensor, it's not the platform, it's the data, and the way the laws are being written are increasingly going to impact, um, you know, these communities, particularly as you aggregate data at a very uh, granular level, which you want to do because of the value, but then you do have these concerns that have been talked about, and then from a strategic plan standpoint, how do you identify the budgets and resources? How do you combine those? How do you make sure that you're working together? You're going to the right, you're training the right folks to deal with this thing. You know, there's sci scientists, but also image processing and data scientists and all the different aspects of this that creates this ecosystem. It's it's it, there needs to be an effort to work together because in many parts of the world, I believe these sectors are not big enough to do things on their own. But if they can work together and can show some value, then maybe to Andre's point again a little bit earlier, um, you know, work with the policymakers to explain why we need to do this, why we need more budget, why we need more resources, because this is what we can do together. And so that's that's part of the strategic align, strategic planning um, potential alignment that I can see. So that's my um, that's my talk. Um, happy to answer any questions or participate in any any discussion that gets gets place. I hope it was uh, it takes place, but I hope it was um, you know gives a little bit of what I was thinking. I, I I just I'm I'm excited at what's happening in the space sector. I'm I'm obviously very excited about what geospatial can do, and I'd just like to make sure that in you know countries that they can they can work together, and and I think the policy and legal part of that is going to be important. Thank you. Um, thank you, Kevin. Uh, that was an excellent lecture. Uh, and maybe I start off with um, a question that may be, uh, I don't know, it may look simple. And um, for, especially for the folks in the space community, um, from your view, what's the difference between the space community and the geospatial? Because those in the space view that geospatial is kind of part of space since maybe yeah, they, uh, they, they deal with X observation and satellites. So how do you differentiate the two communities? Well, I, I'm not sure. Well, I think, I think like with many aspects of the geospatial community, it overlaps, but it isn't entirely the same. So I don't, I, I, I'd like to answer this in the flip, I, flip side in that I don't, I don't. I I think the space sector is dealing with a lot of issues, like I've said, human space flight and um, exploration and and science for science purposes and military and defense that are very separate from the geospatial community. But for many parts of the world, there's a lot of money and time and effort and and actually justification for space programs, talking about Earth observation, PNT communication, and I think that's where the overlap is. So. Um, but I also think the geospatial community is 
has to do with a lot of, you know, in a lot of sectors, it has that overlap. That's part of the challenge of this community is that the geospatial touches upon a lot of different sectors, a lot of different technologies. So, for instance, um, you know, geospatial community is intimately involved with the location data that's being collected from mobile devices. That, but the most of those are regulated by the communications community, the telecommunications community, right? And and so they're very separate, but there's overlap. And I see the same thing in the in the space community. Not sure if that that helps um, answer the question or not, but I see I see a tremendous amount of overlap um, in between the two communities, recognizing that they're not they're not identical. Yeah, I, but even from one of your slides, you actually showed the overlap where the two communities come together. Uh, so if you have any question or comment, you can raise your hands or if you want to put it on the chat box. I see a question from uh, uh, Rose, but I said it's a follow on question. I, I don't know, is there a previous question to this, Rose? No, 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 I was just, I was just adding it to the queue of questions. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Uh, so there's a question on the uh, on the chat, and um, Kevin, if you can. Um, yeah. So the question the question is um, the use of geospatial data as evidence in the court of law. This has particular relevance in con the context of protecting resources like um, IUU fishing or piracy or combating pollution from artisanal mining or the illegal extraction of resources like water animals. Um, I think that's a really that's a really good question, Rose, um, and it's one that is going to need to be resolved here fairly um, fairly soon. And and I think there's there's several different layers to that, right? So if you're you're looking at is it is it something that you can bring in the court of a law of a particular country, or or is it do you need to bring it to sort of an inter international tribunal like the International Criminal Court? And those have different um, at a very broad level, ge geospatial is as as in court. There are there's a significant body of literature and rules around what qual qualifies as evidence and how you can use something as evidence in a court of law, whether it be at a national level, local level, or an international level. Those rules are very different, and they are always trying to keep up with the latest technologies. And then there's this concept of, you know, chain of evidence or chain of control. Who can you show that the data has not been manipulated throughout the process um, so that a jury or a judge can um, can 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 make sure that this is what it says it is. And when you start looking at digital imagery, you start looking at deep fakes, you can see people starting to question the validity. And can you show me that it hasn't that the chain of custody regarding this data has been in such a way that it hasn't been tampered with. I think that's something that most people in the space community and in the geospatial community aren't really thinking about in terms of when they're collecting this data. Um, I say most, there, there are obviously some that are. Um, and then also is the technology so advanced, so cutting edge that juries and judges can believe that they can be, that they're not, they're not fallible, right? That they're just not, um, you know, smoke and mirrors or whatever, right? So you need to you need to be able to show, have an expert testify, for instance, in terms of yes, this this data says here's why this data or this product that's developed or this evidence that we introduced can apply because this technology is at a point where you can trust it. And there are several different in the U.S. courts, and I'm not a you know I'm first of all I'm not a someone who goes to to trial. But in you know the, in U.S. courts they have different rules of laws of evidence at the international court. You see this a lot when it comes to, um, to prosecuting crimes and how do you use imagery. So the short answer is Rose. It's very complicated, but it is an area that I think for this community is going to be increasingly important because not only in sort of the formal process, but the informal to meet targets for countries to claim that they're meeting targets. You need to be able to show that this data is accurate enough and precise enough for the particular um, applications being used for. I hope that helps. Yeah, that's, that's really great. And I'd say, uh, so like an example, I would say uh, in the Gulf of Guinea, 
there is there's a lot of illegal fishing happening and there's always a challenge to successfully get because you so many countries so close to each other you've really sort of sliced thinly these pieces of of the ocean and it's hard to get a, you know, an interdiction a coast guard like function to the right point at the right time and so uh, a scenario that i'm interested in is you know could could you use remote sensing data to prove bad actions, and then you can pursue that in the court of law without ever necessarily having to do the physical interdiction as sort of the classic, uh, you know, Coast Guard arresting people on the boat in the ocean somewhere, you know, uh, even even if the fine is uh, $10,000, you know, or rough equivalent, you know, it's, it's, it's not so much that, you know, a large criminal organization can handle, um, but but it would create friction in an area where there is no friction uh, to, to slow this kind of legal activity down. And then you could apply sort of a similar logic to, to other, you know, other areas. Um, uh, and I know, I think the United States uses uh, um, trusted institutions to validate data, you know, that's going to, to a court of law, right? You know, so, and I don't know, I, I'm sorry, I don't know enough about this yet. Um, but it's a pattern. I don't know if there's a, a recommended pattern somewhere um, that, that could be a starting point for uh, many of our friends and colleagues online today to, to start figuring out how to create, you know, a structure to be able to leverage uh, uh, this data to fight to fight crime and illegal pollution and many other challenges in this range. So I, I will say something that I that I've said in many institutions. I mean, those, those are all excellent points, Rose. But um, it's a lot of a lot of these rules of evidence, a lot of these um, structure for courts and systems are, are at the national level, right? And we we want that to be the case. So if if you need to get with lawyers in your countries and talk about, you know, here's what we have, how it can be used, what do we need to do to make sure that it can be used in a court of law by, you know, law enforcement or regulatory authorities, how can we collect it, how can we store it, how can we document it, what metadata do you need, what expertise do you need to bring along with it, those are the discussions that that you should be having with your regulators and their lawyers and and lawyers in the in the um, community now uh, because that's that's where you're going to get the most valuable. Someone such as myself can say, okay, here's some of the things you need to think about, but the rules are going to be very different because the legal systems are very different, right? And so that's that's one thing to consider. There are organizations, and I'd be happy to. And I'm a member of the International Bar Association. There are international bar associations that are very, you know, interested in these type of things more sort of broadly um, for transnational issues. So I think that, um, you know, those those are the type of things that, you know, you could engage with. I'd be happy to put you in touch with people who are on committees that look at those sort of things. Um, and I know it's I know it's being discussed. I don't have, you know, I don't know how long it, you know, who's involved from various countries and what's the best way to to interact with them. That's a fantastic starting point. I really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, Kendrick, I see your hand raised up. Uh, after that, then we take the next question on the chat. Uh, Kendrick? Hello. Hello, guys. My name is Kendrick Faison. I am uh, Kevin's colleague here in the United States and also a minority-owned business here. Uh, I, I just want to touch on a couple mm -hmm. points that Kevin has spoke about. As you guys know, here in the United States this week, uh, most of our colleagues in the space industries here in Boulder, I mean, excuse me, in Colorado Springs at our space symposium. In about two more weeks, uh, Kevin, we'll all be in St. Louis at the Geo Inc. conference. So basically, two of the two worlds that Kevin just talked about, and we're totally in two different uh, uh, silos that he spoke about. Um, I have uh, been working with a lot of African geospatial uh, consortiums, organizations, and a lot of younger geospatial practitioners um, that sometimes to me, as being in the United States, we have a bunch of, you know, national consortiums, state and local consortiums, which our, our demographic is different here in the U.S. Um, and, I, and I've attended the Space Symposium and very, and, and track the work in the space industry as well. Um, and, but the issues are the same. And what Kevin talked about is data management, uh, data analytics, you know, understanding policies, uh, data policies, those things are very important. But one of the things that I have yet to see is that culmination of that geospace correlation in Africa. Um, I know I've worked with uh, Nigeria, folks from Nigeria, stuff, people in Ghana, 
And I really, if I were to give any, uh, you know, insight in regards to the conversation, is collaboration is very important. And Kevin knows this. We, we're at the table uh, here in the United States trying to collaborate on just multiple geospatial issues. Uh, but even in the space community, the collaboration side of the house, when you talk about uh, satellite imagery for disaster management, uh, broadband mapping, um, cadastral data, like the space industry in Africa, I think that it's, it's so important for you guys to be able to collect your own data, your own imagery, so that you can actually have more richer data sets, but also being able to work with companies that similar to mine and many others here in the States that can actually help you and guide you on some of the uh, policies and, and, and best practices that we have. And so I, I would just behoove you guys to really look at, look and identify those geospatial organizations that are across Africa and try your best to kind of at least understand what they're working with and, and see if there's any center line that you guys can meet at to understand their technological and policy issues and see if there's any way that you guys can have a collective geospatial space uh, policy for the, the continent or even regions of Africa uh, that you guys can build on. Yeah, th thanks Kendrick. And uh, perhaps if you want to share your maybe contacts on the chat box so that those that want to reach out to you can do that as well, that'll be fine. Um, uh, so, uh, Kevin, you, uh, there's another question on the chat box from, uh, well, I'm not sure I know how to pronounce this, Doug, Doug, or something, Lego. Um, so, so, Doug asks, given the expense and high level of investment required to collect geospatial data, how can the capture of this data by wealthy countries and elites only be prevented? Oh, by wealthy countries and elites only be prevented. In other words, how do we better share the data equitably? That's a that's an interesting question to me. Uh, you know, really, really good question. Um, and I've had a number of conversations around this because I, I, I think there's a. I mean, first of all, there's a push, right? Geo and other other you know international organizations on the Earth observation side, um, and others are trying to trying to promote Earth observation data, satellite governments to make their Earth observation data more readily available. The World uh, Meteorologist Organization, you know, promotes open sharing of of data for weather. Um, so there's there's a, at the at the national level and the international level for government systems, there is this push. Now, I'm not saying that it's perfect, and there are, I would imagine, there are a number of reasons why that's the case. But I think there are people that are that are pushing hard on that, and and I I, I don't have any particular expertise associated with that in general, other than I think governments have different ways of looking at data. In the United States, for instance, um, first of all, our constitution says that you, the gov U.S. government can't copyright um, data protected from an intellectual property standpoint. That has significant ramifications in terms of what it can and can't do with the data. And it makes open data in a lot of ways, a lot easier. Now, having said that, we have very high, um, you know, satellites that the defense and intelligence community operate, where that data is not open and shared. It's protected for national security purposes, and they don't, you know, they're not they're not looking at sharing that because they they think that, you know, there is a U.S. advantage of not doing so, right? And I and I get that. I, I would imagine for many countries of the world, that's that same. There's that same tension, right? So. Maybe their systems are not as exquisite as the U.S. systems or the um, Chinese systems or the Russian systems, but they're on that line between what's a national security data a system and what's what's someone else's system. I mean, what should be used for civil? I mean, that's that that has that comes up and that has to be discussed and resolved. Part of the issue is, and I think this question is is getting to that is there's a lot many companies that are hoping to launch their own satellites and have launched their own satellites to collect. Earth observation data, and they have to have a return on their investment. So this sense that, well, if you sell it to one person and then it should be freely shared to deal with um, all the other types of um, issues that are being, being there, I get that at one level. But to me, data is an asset, particularly on the private sector side. So if you spend a lot of money to collect that asset, 
you need to get a return on your investment or you're not going to be able to keep on collecting it. It is not a frictionless process where you make it freely available, but you continue to launch satellites, you continue to build ground stations, you, you continue to enhance your, your capabilities. And to me, it's no different than software, right? I mean, software is also an intangible asset. It's very valuable in a lot of the things that these this community does, but we see software different than data. And I don't, I don't, I'm still struggling trying to understand why that is. Data is very valuable, but as I mentioned earlier, I don't think that we can rely just on government data, government systems to solve these problems. We have to find a way to work with the private sector, have to find a way to fund those purchases. There are several different ways that could be done. There's probably several that I haven't even thought of or haven't had discussions with. But I do think there's a mindset involved about how we look at data, not just from a funding standpoint, but as an asset that you need to protect its its um, protect its value and protect against the risk. And I think we're moving towards protecting against the risk, maybe too far, but we're not thinking about, okay, it's a real valuable asset for many organizations and just like other you know assets and tangible and intangible assets that organizations have. So that's that's how I see it. I understand that it needs need to figure out how to share it to deal with these issues, but I think we also need to respect its its essence, if you will, as to where it fits in, like any other asset, uh, any other asset that we use. We talk about data as being like oil. We talk about it being, um, you know, this this incredible tool, which it is. But there's also value associated with that, and with that comes legal and other um, associated complexities. Um, there's a question. What advice would you give to countries that are in the process of drafting? I'm sorry. Is there someone else have their hand up? I just I saw that next question. No, no not really. Uh, but I was going to read the next question, but um, just a comment. So uh, as you may be aware, at the um, we are currently running a course now. We call it the Space Policy Course. Where we are trying to teach on how um, countries in Africa. Uh, can develop um, national space policies and strategy. Interestingly, we also have some participants from outside Africa, from Malaysia, Romania, and even somebody from the US. Uh, so one of the questions which I want to ask, and you can tie it up with the question from Samuel Malika, is um, do, uh, do countries need to have a separate um, geospatial policy or geospatial law separate from their national space policy or space um, strategy? And then you can tie it up with the question from um, Samuel Maleka. Um, it's asking for advice for countries um, that are in the process of drafting their national aerospace policies and strategies and don't have anything, no policy framework for GIM yet. So I will tell you that in many countries, yes, there that that have space programs there is a space policy and there is a you know in some instances there's a geospatial policy there there is there are differences right in lots of different areas so i don't i don't mean to suggest that you can have one policy that covers it both because i i don't think you can um if you've got a space policy that's further along than a geospatial policy i think I think what you want to do, what I, the way I would look at it is you don't want to create anything in your space policy that is going to contradict or hurt what you're trying to do on the, on the, geo, on the geospatial side. So at the very least, they can't, you don't want them to conflict. So you need to be talking to your counterparts in the geospatial communities, in the mapping agencies, in the statistic agencies, in some of the other big agencies that are working in this. This is what we think we're doing. Is this in any way going to hurt what you're trying to do with your spatial data infrastructure? There's some overlap on data themes in most countries. You know, a lot of countries have data, you know, imagery as a data theme, making sure those uh, there's no conflict there. The next step, I think, would be um, next thing I think would be the um, aligning. So if they don't conflict, the next level would be, OK, let's see if we can work together to get some of the conflict concepts in the geospatial information management into the space sector, particularly space policy, particularly if it's a policy very broad, if you can if you can bring some of those concepts in, again, it's not a law, 
but it's it's useful to begin the discussion. And again, you need to, as, as Kendrick has said, you need to collaborate, you need to work with the geospatial community, say, what are the big issues around Earth observation data that you want us to sort of start promoting? And, and there are several that you can you can think about. You know, we've talked about some of them now around, you know, data sharing or open data um or you know tasking where what sector it's going to focus on in terms of focus on in the data so that's the that's the second level and then the third level is you can and i've seen this before you can sort of reference each other's efforts right to say where we will not you know the space policy will work with the geospatial community to resolve these issues they'll set up a stakeholder committee they'll they'll um they'll create a you know a separate meetings that are on a regular basis to talk about these issues forums that type of thing so those are just a couple of the ways that i see it where you can sort of start you know you don't want to conflict because that's going to be i think bad for both communities if possible you'd at least at least like to align um but if you if you can do more it would be find ways to integrate coordinate and work together that's that's my that's my thought Okay, thank you. Um, we have time for maybe one or two more um, questions or comments. Otherwise, um, uh, I, I, Andre, if you're still around, can I still bring you in at this point? Yes, you you can you can. Yeah. So um, uh, uh, we I, I don't I don't think there's any more questions coming in. Uh, Maybe I'd like you to give some final remarks, but maybe I just wanted to also chip in on this discussion generally about um, what Kevin has spoken about. But one of the points he has mentioned is about um, trying to bring um, different communities together. Uh, and I was wondering whether, because I know this is not purely African, there are many people uh, from outside Africa here, but the concept of the African Space Leadership Congress, uh, mainly the ALC, uh, I don't know whether that was the concept about trying to bring different communities together, this geospatial and other communities. Uh, if and if that's um, if that idea is still in mind, and then you can now tie it up with some your, your final remarks. Um, yes, I I believe that um, we have the UNGGM Africa process where um, some of the policy and legal aspect of uh, geospatial information management is also being considered. And, and uh, I, I think that uh, um, it will be good to ensure that uh, those stakeholders are also part of the UNGTM Africa processes. This is where maybe the dialogue and the discussion can happen and then we can widen it or open it to um, anyone who is interested in geospatial information and space information development in, 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 in Africa. Uh, for instance, the, the African Union who is leading uh, the space subset of the broader geospatial and uh, community in Africa is also a, a key stakeholders from our point of view of the UNGGM Africa processes. So uh, maybe this is where we can bring everyone together so that we, we, we collectively reflect on setting this overarching um, legal or regulatory framework uh, for, for, for the entire continent. And then from there, every country can now downscale it at its own level or uh, given to his own circumstances. Um, as a concluding remark, if I may say something like that, I, I believe that uh, within the UNGGM Africa process, we want to further take forward what we have been discussing for, for several years. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we need something that is encompassing everything uh, for the African continent uh, uh, at the first instance. And then we can now use it as a mechanism to um, 
to engage with member state countries to develop their own their own uh, legal and and policy related uh, uh, frameworks now um, this can be achieved through um, many ways uh, and uh, I take the opportunity to say that uh, uh, we want to further strengthen the, the discussion with uh, Kevin on how we can we, 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 we can make it this happen. In particular, uh, we are seeing uh, during the last couple of years, discussion around the ethical and responsible use of uh, special enabled information and those aspects are not yet fully uh, integrated to, or taken into consideration in the African context. And we want to, 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 to get this, this specific aspect being considered. Uh, we have been also uh, discussing am among ourselves uh, geospatial or space related community. Uh, maybe we need to uh, bring on board um, uh, those who have uh, the knowledge and the capacity uh, related to, to laws, to treaties, to regulations, to frameworks uh, into the process. Uh, it might be some things we need to also look at and, and get uh, some guiding principle on how we can bring lawyers and uh, uh, people in this side into our process. At the early stage, we are still struggling to, to identify or to see people with uh, core competency in space law or, or geospatial law in Africa. We don't have yet, we have some people, but not uh, a critical mass of people who can best advise us uh, as, we, as we proceed. Then we need to get all these people uh, together. So we are moving at our own pace uh, very slowly but this is work in progress, if I may say like that. And I thank uh, the African Space uh, Leadership Institute for uh, uh, setting the scene for this kind of dialogue uh, from our side, as the UNGGM Africa and as the Economic Commission for Africa, we'll ensure that uh, we, we continue pushing forward to, 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 to build um, this kind of uh, framework that are very critical to how we ensure that uh, geospatial and space related information permeate every aspect of the African society. This is our vision and then we'll work toward that. Thank you, a team. Uh, th thank you, Andre. And um, uh, just as you mentioned, uh, one of the purpose of this webinar, it's um, uh, we, you know, you talked about the competency in geospatial policy and law. It's very low in Africa, and that's why the ASLI um, is starting this initiative. Um, we hope to build on this webinar, and as we've discussed before, hopefully to follow this up with um, uh, a workshop and uh, maybe a course later on geospatial policy and law. So um, as uh, I'm going to discuss this more with uh, Andrea and get information out um, as we plan ahead. Um, just before I close, uh, there's a question that was sneaked in. Uh, 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 Kevin, would you quickly like to respond to that from Georgiana? How are geospatial standards built or how do we set those standards through what methods from a strategic point of view? Yeah, so so I, I respond to everyone. The IGIF has has some some language on on standards, um, and so I I think it's actually one of the strategic pathways. So I would encourage everyone that are interested in that, and because I agree, it's a it's an excellent point. It's an important issue, particularly when you're bringing in different communities. You need to make sure that the data is interoperable, um, and so that standards are a big part of that. But I. I, I have been involved in the OGC. I've been Open Geospatial Consortium, um, which does standards for geospatial, but I, I'm not a technical standards guy by any means. So I would encourage you to review that strategic pathway as you as you look forward in that. Well, th thanks so much, Kevin. Thanks for the lecture. Um, thanks for your time.
and then we we'll, we we'll look forward to having you again as we plan towards um, other programs developing trying to develop capacity within the continent on um, to special policy and law. Uh, many thanks to all our participants from uh, different parts of the world. I can see some familiar names. Uh, really appreciate your coming and um, let's keep in touch. Uh, oh. And for those who are the space symposium, I wish you a very good deliberation. Um, next week, we have the New Space Africa Conference here too, which I think it's also bringing a large community of space, but um, it's going to be another interesting um, meeting there. So I hope to I, I hope to be there and I hope to see as many people as possible from this meeting there too. So thank you and um, have a great rest of the day. All right. Thank you, yeah. Tim. Appreciate the opportunity. Bye now. Thank you very much.